we might well wonder whether ancient Greek civilization still has anything to say to us. Travel around Athens today and you see that the modern city looms much larger than the traces of its past. And yet, just as we get the odd glimpse of old buildings, so too it's sometimes possible to catch a hint of the ideas the ancient Greeks have given us. Almost 2,500 years ago, a philosopher was born here. His name was Socrates, and he's come to symbolize one of philosophy's most inspiring gifts to the rest of us. The idea that thinking logically about our lives might help us to be more certain of ourselves, more independent, less conformist, less hamstrung by what other people think. It's the dream that philosophy might set us free. I'd come to Athens to see how a man who famously died for his beliefs might give us the confidence to stand up for our own. Socrates wrote nothing down, and we know what he said chiefly through a series of dialogues he features in, written by his pupil Plato. We're not even sure that this strange little statue is of him. We know he was born in 469 BC and was married to a famously shrewish woman called Xanthippe. When asked why he'd married her, he replied that a horse trainer had to practice on the most spirited animals. There is one fact about him that stands out. Among all ancient philosophers, he is perhaps the greatest. And there is no clearer evidence of this fact than that he's the only philosopher readily available as a fridge magnet. The magnet suggests another fact about Socrates, that he was extraordinarily ugly. In history of a subject with many notably ugly practitioners, he was surely the ugliest. Even his very good friends compared him to a stingray, a satyr and a grotesque. He compounded his looks by almost never washing, rarely changing his cloak and never wearing any sandals. It was said that he'd been born in order to spite shoemakers. Socrates' idiosyncratic habits point the way to one of his most inspiring ideas that we should find ways to build confidence in our own beliefs and not be too swayed by the opinions of others. There are great similarities between humans and sheep. We may not have wool on our backs or emit buying sounds, but we often have an urge to follow our fellow creatures passively and have a horror of breaking away from the group. Why do we follow sheepishly behind other people, particularly important other people? Largely because we imagine they must know what they're talking about, and so we trot along behind them. Until 1998, Andrew Miller was a loyal employee at this company, British Biotech in Oxford, where he was Director of Clinical Research but he began to think that his employers were being over-optimistic about the drugs they were developing and that the shareholders weren't getting an accurate picture. He was forced to confront an agonizing question. Could it really be possible that he was right, even though all 11 members of the biotech board were against him? What, what does it feel like to be one man uh, thinking that something that you're saying is right and 11 other people saying, no, you're wrong? What does that feel like? Well, it's a frustrating situation. It's, um, you know... Is it I mean, terrifying as well? If I could... If I, well, I, <laughs> I wouldn't say terrifying, but it is preoccupying, and it does stop you sleep, sleeping. And you do, you know, your mind does start to play tricks on you that, that you know, do make you doubt your sanity to a certain extent, because... You know, one's previous experience in, in a democracy is overall, you know, the majority tends to have a certain amount of right on its side. And to be honest, in a lot of ways, I was at my wit's end. I used to sit in my office clutching my temples, thinking, have I got this wrong? You know, am I misinterpreting these things? I mean, the, the, the science and the technology can be thought of as complicated and confusing. But for me, it's my everyday work, and I understand it well. And you, you start doubting your own sanity. You think, why, why is it? Why, have, why do I think this, and these 11 guys who are on the board think differently? Tell me a bit about the pressure to conform in a company like British Biotech. Well, I think in all companies there are pressures to conform. There are cultures in all companies. 
you know, yeah. these are people who you like and who you're working with. And actually what you want to do is to, you know, appease them. They're your bosses. Um, you, you are wanting to appease them. You are wanting to help them. You are wanting to work with them. You want to be friends with them. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. The first reason why it's hard to feel confident in Andrew's situation is that we tend to accept that people in authority must be right. The European community has said this beef is utterly safe. The it's this assumption that Socrates wanted us to challenge by urging us to think logically about the nonsense they often come out with rather than being struck dumb by their aura of importance and air of suave certainty. To start a fight to cut out the cancer of bent and twisted journalism in our country with the simple sword of truth and the trusty shield of traditional British fair play, so be it. In deciding when to follow prominent people and when to disagree with them, Socrates had one huge advantage over us. He could always talk to them in person. Athens in his day had a population of just 150,000. And all the citizens came here to the Agora, the main market and meeting place of Athens. If you'd have visited in the 5th century BC, you'd have been likely to see, amongst the bustle of the city, a rather curious, ugly figure. Because for most of his adult life, Socrates got up at dawn and came to spend the day amongst the shopkeepers and merchants who had their stalls here. It wasn't just local people who came uh, to this spot. It was also the most important people in Athenian society, so that you could meet here at any point in the day, probably, as it were, the opinion formers, the great military generals, the great statesmen, the important rhetoricians, the aristocrats. They could all be found here. And what Socrates did, rather than just idly chatting to people, he would go up to these very important people and ask them great questions on life. He'd basically ask them to explain why they were living the kind of life they were leading. And what happened is that he found there were surprising inadequacies uh, in their understanding of the way of life they were leading, so that wealthy people couldn't really explain why they had money and others didn't. Uh, military generals couldn't explain why they fought battles in a certain way. And I think we take away from this a fascinating lesson which is that if you have the luck, uh, or at least the courage, to go up to important people and question uh, the way that they're leading their lives, you might be able to find surprising inadequacies of which their very confident uh, demeanor gave absolutely no indication. The second reason we may hesitate to challenge other people is that we all know, in our calmer moments, how easy it is to make trouble for the wrong reasons because we're feeling pig-headed or bloody-minded. Socrates was a non-conformist, and he made trouble for Athenians. But he wasn't motivated by an arrogant wish that everyone should do things his way, nor by the kind of willful eccentricity we might think of when we hear that he went around barefoot and never washed his cloak. What makes his non-conformity valuable is that it was motivated by the desire to find the truth and challenge lazy assumptions, rather than the wish to make trouble. I think this is roughly what Socrates would do. He'd walk down the main streets in the marketplace of Athens and go up to people and ask them large questions about the meaning of life, which is, in a way, a very fascinating thing to do and also a very irritating thing to do. If you ask people to explain their beliefs, they'll tend to react with um, aggression a lot of the time. We'll, we'll see what happens here. Excuse me, can you, can you tell me, what do you think justice is? Um, <laughs> that's a little hard to say. It is? That's uh, a good question. I guess just making sure that everyone gets what is like right and fair. Excuse me, can I just ask you a question? What do you think justice is? La justice. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez que la justice? Going up to people and asking them to explain their beliefs is pretty scary if you're at all shy like me. People look at you strangely. They imagine that if you ask them to explain why they're living in a certain way, that you know the answer and are in some way claiming a position of superiority over them. The French, who are supposedly the most philosophical nation, seem to be scoring very low on our Socratic test here, but. Um, We'll see what happens next. Socrates had no such inhibitions. He preferred to be thought a bit over-intense and weird 
than allow his fellow citizens to continue to muddle along unthinkingly. He wanted all of us to scrutinise what we believed, even on our way to the shops. Excuse me, sir. Can I just ask you, what do you think the good life is? No, no, it doesn't know. As you can probably imagine, Socrates annoyed a lot of Athenians in this way. But at the heart of his approach is an extremely egalitarian idea that everyone has the duty to reflect on their life and that we are all surprisingly capable of doing so. You have to be in order to be happy. Um, you need to have fun. Um, yeah. You need to have um, people that love and care about you and right. people to love and care. We're not often expected to explain why we live the way we do. Socrates asks us to overcome our laziness and timidity, to work out what we really think and stand by it once we have. Self-control, being able to say what you mean at exactly the right time and get your message across. Philosophy, in his hands, is an invitation open to us all to intelligent non-conformity. We just, we just think we're philosophers. <laughs> Socrates doesn't just give us the confidence to challenge prevailing ideologies, beliefs and traditions. He also offers us a way to develop beliefs of our own which can help us to strike out from the crowd. And the way to do so is to put them through a rigorous test which he devised. If our opinions can survive Socrates' test, then they will truly be worth standing up for. The reason why there are a lot of woolly or at least imprecise ideas out there in the world is that many people imagine that you can come up with a good idea without thinking too hard about it. Socrates thought this was crazy, and to bring out the insanity of this position, compared thinking to potting. And no one would imagine that you could make a good pot without at least following some pretty rigorous steps. And yet many people imagine that you could come up with a good ethical idea, an idea on how to live your life, without thinking too hard about it. Socrates went further in his analogy. He actually came up with a distinct method, a Socratic method of thought. He identified five distinct steps which anyone who wants to come up with a good thought would have to follow in order to do so. And these thoughts can roughly be summarized as follows. Firstly, look around you for statements that many people would describe as plain common sense. For example, that the best jobs are those which are most highly paid, or that happiness comes from being married. Secondly, try and find an exception to this. Could you ever be married and yet unhappy? Or could you ever be in a very well-paid job and yet miserable? Thirdly, if an exception to this statement is found, it must mean that your statement is false or at least imprecise. And in this case, we find that there is an imprecision. Fourthly, try to nuance the initial statement to take the exception into account. So in our example, realize that it is possible to be quite unhappy in a very highly paid job if it's completely creatively unfulfilling, or to be quite miserable in a marriage if you've married the wrong person. Lastly, you continue this process for as long as possible. You keep trying to find exceptions to your common sense statement. And Socrates said that the truth, insofar as anyone's ever able to reach the truth, lies in a statement which it seems impossible to disprove. If we test our opinions in this way, Socrates believed, we'll be able to construct trustworthy and watertight thoughts, in just the same way as a skilled potter makes trustworthy and watertight pots. The point of Socrates' method is that it makes you far less passive, less inclined to follow the other sheep. If other people disagree, we don't just have to say, limply or petulantly, well, I think I'm right, but I can't tell you why. We'll be able to demonstrate logically why we believe things, and if others ignore the logic, then their opposition won't have to unnerve us so badly. Most of us imagine that we can't be philosophers because we haven't studied philosophy, we haven't read enough, we haven't gone to school long enough, we haven't done a university degree. And I think what I find extremely inspiring in Socrates is the idea that everyone can think. And not just everyone can think, but everyone has a responsibility to think. As he famously put it, the unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates made the idea of an examined life seem far from forbidding. Socrates suggests that we can have an interesting philosophical conversation anywhere, even on a street corner. Philosophy needn't just happen behind the walls of a university or in a schoolroom. Socrates used to talk to an extraordinary range of people, 
and like to demonstrate to them that they were all able to arrive at well thought out opinions. It's an inspiring idea. However, in our modern democratic societies, where focus groups and opinion pollsters rule, Socrates would have thought that our problem is that we tend to listen to opinions whether they're well thought out or not. Although Socrates believed that we were all, in theory, capable of living an examined life, he knew that in practice most of us don't. And this meant that he couldn't accept that every opinion was equally worth listening to, any more than that every pot was equally capable of holding water. Strange as it may sound to modern ears, and even though he lived in the very cradle of democracy, Socrates had the gravest reservations about democracy, because he refused to accept that just because the majority supported an opinion, that made it right. And he'd have thought it ridiculous that people in positions of power might be guided by focus groups like this. Most important decisions in ancient Athens were taken according to the will of the majority. Once a month, the whole citizen body would be asked to gather at the foot of the Acropolis and talk about all the important issues facing Athens. And we find exactly the same approach going on today in modern government and business. Polling organisations, rather like this one, gather groups of people and ask them what they think, and then important decisions are taken according to the will of the majority. I think Socrates would have disagreed violently with what's going on in there. He would have objected not just to the decor, I think, but also to the whole approach, which is that the will of the majority should decide an issue. In his eyes, what matters is whether an argument is logical, is reasonable. That's the way that we should make decisions, not according to the will of the majority. Believing that the majority can be wrong and being sure when you are right still doesn't make it easy to hold a minority opinion, particularly when your livelihood's at stake. So what gave Andrew Miller the confidence to stand up against his employers? even though it was to lead him into a bitter battle in the media and the law courts. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you can only see the world with your own eyes. You can try to understand what other people are thinking, and sometimes you can. You know, there are, there are definitely times when someone has some strong views that are quite different from yours, that you respect, you see the basis for them. Um, but that's different from being wrong. You know, I think we can accommodate a lot of differing views, but, but from my point of view, if I do see things that are wrong, I do find it very frustrating. Socrates died for his beliefs. How far were you prepared to go for yours? Well, I think there's a big difference between being an individual and having a family. And once I was put into the media war and into the litigation, I was aware that you know, I was at war, but I had my children at my feet and my wife at my shoulder and um, I really had no choice and I started to realize that the only way out was forwards and um, and so you know we had to sort of fight our way out together litigation it could have destroyed me it was never going to kill me but it could have destroyed me um, and it wasn't a question of being prepared to go that far that's just how far it finished up going. But, you know, funda fundamentally, with regard to sort of my own self-worth, I did think when I looked in the mirror in the morning when I shaved, you know, at least I've, I, I think I've acted according to my conscience. I mean, in a murky situation. Andrew feels that he's been vindicated by the out-of-court settlement he received from his employers. Socrates was not so fortunate. The one fact that people tend to remember about Socrates is that he faced a trial and that he was condemned to death. This has remained a very potent image, so that if you walk around the streets of Athens today, you can still see the scene represented all over the place. And that's because it has become an immensely powerful symbol of someone standing up courageously and intelligently against the will of the majority. The charge against Socrates was of having corrupted the youth of Athens and failing to respect the gods the city worshipped. The potential penalty was death. 
One March morning, uh, Socrates was asked to show up at the courthouse in Athens, and um, Socrates was facing probably a jury of 500 Athenian citizens. And what we do know is that the atmosphere inside the courtroom was relatively hostile towards Socrates from the very beginning. They were suspicious of this man, uh, many of them had, had been questioned by him before, and they were not on his side. So Socrates was really facing the possibility that he would die, and yet he didn't lose his nerve. And Socrates said, if I was allowed more time to make my case to you, uh, dear Athenians, I'm sure I could convince you of the justice uh, of my cause, but I can't. And he accepted this very fatalistically. When the final vote came to be taken, uh, the majority of the jury decided that he was guilty and that he should be sent to death. Socrates was led off from the courtroom to the prison just a few yards away. His wife, Sandhipe, came to visit him, but she broke down so hysterically that she had to be led away. Many of his friends were also in tears. Even the prison warder, who had seen many go to their deaths, offered his apologies and said that of all the people who had ever come through the jail, Socrates was the noblest, the most generous and the wisest. And a few moments later, the executioner came through the door with a cup of hemlock. Socrates was given the cup and asked to drink. And after a few moments, his legs began to feel heavy. Uh, slowly, the paralysis caused by the conine, the paralyzing agent in hemlock, started working through his body. And uh, within a few minutes, his whole body was paralyzed, and his friend Fido reached forward and shut his eyes. In Athens today, there's very little of the glory that was ancient Greece and that has inspired the world ever since. And yet, the ideas of Socrates live on. He was once asked where he came from, and he replied, not from Athens, but from the world. And he remains in many ways the global philosopher, born in Athens, but speaking his message to the whole of humanity. Of course, very few of us will be called upon to die for our beliefs. But Socrates makes us see that we all have the capacity, and indeed the duty, to stop following opinions passively, and instead to develop beliefs we can truly have confidence in. Though we're often reluctant to see it, all of us can make the transition from being a sheep to being a thinking person, that is, a philosopher.